here with Dr. Miki Okaku, and uh, I'd like to ask him a few questions. Okay, fire away. Dr. Kaku, in your opinion, how does the versatility of software development, such as National Instruments LabVIEW, help create the world of tomorrow? Well, if you take a look at hardware versus software, the future, in some sense, belongs to the world of software, in the sense that eventually we'll, we'll measure chips by the ton. Mm -hmm. Chips will be everywhere, including the junkyard. Uh, right now, scrap paper occupies most of our junkyard. Oh, wow. In the future, it'll be chips. So hardware keeps becoming cheaper and cheaper because of mass production, better containerization, better etching procedures, and so on and so forth. But software has a bottleneck, and that is the human mind. You cannot mass produce the human brain. That's a fundamental limitation. As a consequence, in the relationship between hardware and software, software will eventually dominate. Wow, that is pretty cool. So I guess kind of a follow-up question then. Since software has become easier and easier to develop, how can we leverage the creativity of others to really improve society? Well, ultimately, we want to use all this technology to improve society because engine, uh, science is the engine of prosperity. If you look around, everything around us is a byproduct of science. So science is the engine of prosperity, and curiosity is the rocket fuel that drives the engine of science. So we have to keep this thing going. But the problem is that software, even though we can reproduce software, you can hit a button and simply copy software, to create new software is extremely difficult. It requires a human being to sit down in a quiet room with a pencil and paper to crank out, to crank out uh, the code. Machines cannot produce creative software. That's one of the limitations of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has not been able to create uh, things that are imaginative, things that require creativity, talent, analysis, leadership. These are things that artificial intelligence has not been able to do yet. Meaning that software will continue to be a tremendous asset, a source of wealth. Also realize that the wealth of nations is changing from, in, from commodity capital to intellectual capital. Historically, Commodity capital was the wealth of Adam Smith. Okay. If you had tin, copper, gold, paper, you were rich. Mm -hmm. Now we realize that commodities have been dropping in price for 150 years. Mm -hmm. This morning you had breakfast that the King of England could not have had 150 years ago. All the delicacies you take for granted, the kings of Europe couldn't have in the wow. last century. We take it for granted. That's the process of commodity capital declining in price while intellectual capital rises in price. Intellectual capital is not just software, by the way. Mm -hmm. Intellectual capital is also creativity, writing music, telling a joke, being an actor, uh, writing uh, web designs for, for the internet. All these involve the mind, creativity, imagination, which artificial intelligence cannot reproduce yet. Wow. Um, I guess kind of a different question, kind of different genre now. I'm a student pursuing a science and engineering degree. What inspired you to become a physicist? Well, when I was about eight years old, I walked into my classroom one day and all the teachers were hushed. Everyone was talking about the fact that a great man had just died. Everyone was talking about the fact that the greatest scientists of our era had just passed away. And the newspapers flashed a picture of his desk. It was in all the papers. Mm -hmm. And the caption said, greatest work of our greatest scientist, unfinished, oh. his unfinished manuscript. Later, I figured out the man was Albert Einstein. The book that he couldn't finish was called The Unified Field Theory. And I said to myself, well, why couldn't he finish it? I mean, what was so hard that the greatest mind of our time could not finish that problem? So to me, this is greater than any adventure story. This is greater than any murder mystery. I had to know what was in that book. And why couldn't the greatest scientists of our era finish that book? Now we realize that we're after an equation perhaps no more than one inch long. Oh, wow. That will allow us to, quote, read the mind of God. An equation this long, which will explain the four forces of the universe, the creation of the universe, the formation of atoms, stars, and galaxies, maybe even the formation of humans and love. Oh, my God. That's really amazing. That's a theory of everything. And that's what I do for a living. That's my day job. <laughs> that's a pretty cool day job. So I guess I've been exploring the expo floor over the past few days, and I've got to talk to scientists and engineers from all over the world, and they seem to be all pretty excited that I'm excited about engineering. But how do we pass that excitement on to other students? We have to capture the young people's imagination, because they are our future. 
and we have to do it in many, many ways. One way is through fiction. Science fiction, for example, the science fiction of Jules Verne helped to inspire a young Edwin Hubble. Edwin Hubble was destined to become a country lawyer in Missouri. He dropped everything because he remembered reading Jules Verne as a child, got his PhD from the University of Chicago, and became the greatest astronomer of the 20th century. And now we have the Hubble Space Telescope. Now we have the Hubble Space Telescope, we have the Big Bang Theory, the Expanding Universe, uh, all that because one man was inspired by Jules Verne. And Carl Sagan was inspired by uh, John Carter of Mars. He wanted to go to Mars, chase after beautiful princesses of Mars, just like he's written science fiction. So we had to inspire the young people. Now, when I was growing up, Sputnik was the big thing. Everyone talked about Sputnik. It was your patriotic duty to become a physicist or a chemist or an engineer. Mm -hmm. We've lost that. And I think that's very dangerous because the world is not becoming less scientific, it's becoming more scientific. And it's a competitive world out there. And so the United States cannot rest on its laurels. Mm -hmm. It's very sad that in the PhD program in physics in the United States, 50% are foreign born. Oh Only 50% of American PhD students in physics uh, are Americans. And in the City University of New York, where I'm a professor, 100% mm -hmm. of the PhD program is foreign born. So we cannot sustain America's lead in world science if we cannot inspire our young people to go into science. Oh, wow. Well, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to come talk with me. Mm -hmm. uh, it was great, yeah. and uh, thanks for coming to NI Week 2010. Right. My pleasure. Uh, this is Andy Malusi uh, backstage here at the NI Keynote at NI Week 2010.